Hello, and welcome to Connected with Latham, where we discuss ideas, legal developments, and business trends shaping the global economy. I'm Lauren Anderson, a corporate partner in the Houston office, and today we're going to be talking about a topic I think is on a lot of people's minds, and that's shareholder activism. Joining me for this conversation is Chris Drury, a partner in our Chicago office and leader of the firm's activism defense practice. With nearly 15 years in the space, Chris regularly advises our clients and market-leading companies and private equity firms on strategic transactions and corporate governance matters. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Lauren. Happy to be here today. And we're also joined today by Tiffany Campion, a senior attorney in our Chicago office that also focuses on takeover defense and shareholder activism matters, uh, working extensively with management and directors of public corporations on takeover defense planning, shareholder activism, and related corporate governance matters. Welcome, Tiffany. Thanks, Lauren. Happy to be here. So to kick things off, Tiffany, this is a question for you. You know, we've all seen an increase in shareholder activism that seems to be focused on environmental, social, and governance, or ESG factors, particularly in the energy space with big oil, and it's becoming increasingly hard to ignore. We know companies are more focused on sustainable practices, but do you think that's the root cause of this? Lauren, this is a great question um, that you've just asked, and I think there really has been a sea change in the past few years about uh, what investors are focusing on. Um, Historically, ESG was not necessarily top of mind, and ESG meaning environmental, social, and governance matters. But now they really are of uh, main interest for a lot of institutional investors. And as a result, there's a lot of activism campaigns that have ESG elements and are addressing these issues that are near and dear to the investors' minds. So historically, we've seen activists utilize governance best practices as a way to gain a wider a base for their campaigns, to gain interest in them, and to really exploit the vulnerabilities at a target company, gain that support, and also then to weaken the defenses of a company. And now we're seeing activists use environmental and social components in a similar way. Um, they've evolved their tactics and their campaign strategies to really try to widen their base and have their campaigns be of more interest to these investors and to align with the priorities of these long-term investors. So large institutional investors, they really are focused on climate risk and the disclosure practices and a commitment to reduce emissions and to try to have businesses that will thrive in a net zero future. And as those investors become more assertive in trying to obtain those goals, activists are able to obtain support for their campaigns by um, addressing those goals and bringing them in as part of their campaigns. Now, we might not see a campaign solely on those matters. Occasionally, it does happen where that's their sole focus, but more often it's going to be somewhat window dressing, an additional item in the campaign where the activist is also asking for other financial changes that might be related to ESG, but also might be related to other issues. And in this way, activists are really able to have a small investment in a company and to really make large changes by leveraging the ownership of these large institutional investors. Um, We've seen activists with even as little as one share trying to get involved, trying to bring attention to ESG issues as a way to either get those issues in front of other investors or to push forward their financial changes, their other campaign strategies and tactics and their other platforms and their campaigns. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that some of these activists only hold a small number of shares. It kind of puts, I guess, at least for me in the forefront, sort of an interesting question in that it doesn't seem like the focus of these activists is necessarily even return on their own investment from from the perspective of growing these companies or increasing value by furthering these objectives. Do you think it really is a social driver or motivator that's pushing these activist investors to pick up, as you said, a couple of shares and then look to the larger institutional investors to sort of back them in pushing these campaigns? There's really a mix of types of activists. Like not, They can't all be put into one bucket. I would say the main activists, like the big names that we see coming up over and over with financial activism, they might not be aiming to have a ESG change as their sole reason for changing. Um, I would say the ESG items are just a way to gain support for their other financial changes. Other activists are 
gaining traction, though, where they are making ESG matters be their main priority and that that is what they're saying. So some of those investors, it is the primary change. It's, it's really a mix that is very company specific upon who, who the activist is. You know, in these oil companies, they'll want to see a diversity of ways to obtain energy and a diverse portfolio of how energy is being sought going forward. And sometimes the argument is don't diversify. Let's separate the clean energy and the dirty energy. And, and so there's different arguments for each company. And it's very um, specific on the campaign, the activist and, and the situation who the investor, the investor base, if it's a lot of institutional investors or retail investors and, and the makeup. That's right, Tiffany. And another way of looking at it is ESG activism is the new emerging market of activism. And it's been highly successful in some high profile campaigns recently. And what you're seeing some of these funds do is really claim market share in the space by not devoting the capital to an individual campaign and running these one share campaigns as a way to build their reputation and their name. And most importantly to them, their capital under management so that they can progressively go after larger and larger targets. That is really interesting and really helpful background. So thank you both. I guess the next most obvious question that's probably on people's minds is, how do companies prepare for the possibility of ESG activism at their companies? Sure, Lauren. There are a a number of things companies can do in response to all activism and ESG in, in particular. It all starts with being your own activist and evaluating your vulnerabilities, both on the commercial side, the legal side, and now in the ESG realm. And as you look critically at the company, it's always important to stay aligned with where your peer set is. The activists monitor companies versus their peers. Their primary method is total shareholder return. And so if your total shareholder return has been lagging your peer set, and the activist gets to pick whether that's over one year, three years, five years, or 10 years, you're particularly vulnerable and you will be flagged in systems that the activists use to monitor companies. But you can also look at yourself critically with respect to your peers in the various ESGs surveys and rankings. And that is another area that the activists are using to find targets. Your goal here is really to understand where your vulnerabilities are so that you can create alignment between the board and management on the response to those. And in that regard, what the activists try to do is drive a wedge between the management team and the directors. We encourage our clients to always consider their strategic alternatives across a broad range of metrics. Your M&A, capital allocation, governance matters, And we encourage our clients to work with a financial advisor in that process and really show their work to the board of directors so that the management team can demonstrate that they've been thinking critically about the business, about the alternatives out there, that they vetted that analysis with a third party and received validation from that third party financial advisor. And if you do that, You prevent the activists from identifying an issue that management has never brought to the board's attention and considered with the board. The most well-prepared companies will have considered the various lines attack and the various vulnerabilities, address those with the board, and be prepared to respond. I guess it sounds like it's somewhat of an exercise in saying, okay, I'm looking at my peers, I see what they're doing in the market, and I'm and kind of where my industry is, you know, on ESG and these other metrics, and then essentially saying, okay, these are the variety of things others are doing, which of these might make sense for our company or not, let's evaluate and discuss. But at least we're in a position then to say, we are up to date on the market, we know what's going on, and we've made sensible choices about what makes the most sense in the context of this business. I mean, is that more or less kind of what we're talking about? Yes, it's both considering what your peers are doing 
and taking the second step of a critical look at your own business to see if there is some element of it, whether it be capital allocation, whether it be governance, that makes you particularly vulnerable and addressing that proactively with the board. And then I, I guess, is there a push? So obviously the you know management needs to be looking at these things, discussing them with the board. Are companies tending to involve institutional investors at all in that process on the front end so that you know, they're in a position where if if the institutional investor is approached by an activist, the investor can say, well, you know, we're already having these conversations. I'm going to stick with talking to the board and management, or is that not really happening? It's essential that that companies align support. Companies can't prevent an activist from coming, no matter how prepared you are. And so the ultimate goal in your preparations is to align support. You first align support between the board and management through the process we just described. And then once you've developed the strategy that the board and management are deeply aligned on, you engage with your shareholders to ensure that they share your vision for the company. And if they don't share the the vision for the company, you have an open line of communication so you hear from them before an activist does. The institutional shareholders, if they're not happy with how a company is being managed or with the strategic decisions it's making, they have two options. They can pick up and call the company, and if you have a strong relationship with them, hopefully they'll do that first, or they can pick up the phone and call an activist and instigate the activist campaign against the company. And so a well-prepared company has a strong relationship with their institutional and other shareholders. So hopefully the first call comes to the company and the management team rather than the activist. Yeah, that's really interesting. I guess I hadn't realized, I sort of had assumed that the activist investors were really targeting the other institutional investors, but it sounds like it goes both ways. And sometimes you actually have an institutional investor that sort of initiates the, the activist investor interest. That happens regularly, and it is a a two-way street between the institutional investors and the activists who are constantly communicating about a range of different investments and companies. That is really interesting. Tiffany, let me ask you this question. It seems like, you know, there's always this potential for new regulations. There's, you know, this environment of an ever-changing investor voting policy situation. And so it it seems like, you know, to some degree, this continues to be maybe a bit of a, a moving target. How can a company ensure that its board is equipped for, you know, the types of evaluations and communications that we've been discussing? You are certainly right, Lauren. It's definitely a rapidly developing landscape. Um, And I think we're going to continue to see more development and more agreement on what type of standards are going to be the most important, what's going to be used to evaluate companies. But the first step for a company and their company's board is really to make sure that ESG issues are a priority for the board, that it's on the board's agenda, that they know that this is going to be a key item of interest for investors and that they understand that the board is overseeing these matters and is ultimately responsible for them. With that, the biggest thing for the board then is to be educated about sustainability and climate matters and oversight so that they're fluent on these issues and they're well-versed on the company's position and as well as Chris mentioned, the practice of their peers and these expectation of other investors, what they want to see. Sometimes this might take, you know, making a step back, thinking about, is our board ready to handle these issues? Do they have the education and the expertise or can we give them the education expertise? Sometimes at this point, it's important to think about maybe expanding your board or changing and shuffling your board to make sure that you have the right expertise on the board that is ready to handle these ESG issues for your company and that have the right experience. But with that in mind, it's also key not to silo a specific, you know, your one ESG expert to be looking at the ESG committee and have all of the knowledge and expertise with that one person. It's important that the entire board is considering it and that that information is being spread across the board. And in this way, if an activist comes up and has a concern about the board and the board addressing it, you have a good history, a record of doing it, and you're able to uh, know that you 
pulled on the appropriate expertise onto the board before the activist arises, and it won't be a point of contention for the activist. Specifically, the board wants to make sure that the company's establishing ESG goals and metrics, that they know where they're headed, um, and that they know also Uh, Who's assessing those ESG efforts? Why are their opinions important? There's so many third parties out there looking at it, and it's good to understand what they're looking for and how they'll be evaluating the company. The company should know, the board should understand if they do use an ESG reporting standard, which one they're using and, and the importance of that framework and what the aspects of that framework are. The board should be considering whether the company provides adequate quantitative ESG data so they can look at them over a period of time. Maybe they need to do some fine tuning on those quantitative metrics. It's important to the board to be thinking of the company, whether they are managing this ESG reporting and tracking it over time again. And also, does the board approve the publication of ESG reporting and ESG disclosures? It's important to have a history of looking at this to be able to evaluate historical changes, but it's also good to be thoughtful about what you're disclosing to investors, um, what promises you're making or what you're implying and how it could be look you know, looking back, whether it could be make a positive story about the company, or is it a truthful and accurate story, or how it could be twisted to by an activist to potentially create a different story that is maybe inaccurate. It is important to be looking at all of this information about ESG. And there really are institutions and also the regulators, SEC, are they're on the lookout for greenwashing, for companies making things look better and rosier than they are. So it's imp- you need to strike a balance. It's a difficult situation because the board's really at the forefront of striking a balance between being honest, but not inflative, and responsive, but not overly inclusive, um, and to right have this level of disclosure that will be accurate and best um, put forward a story for the company. And Tiffany, I, I'm seeing more and more companies and pushes from the institutional investors to tie executive compensation to these ESG goals and ESG metrics as part of the overall compensation package. Are you seeing that as well? Yes, I am, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that makes sense, I guess, as a, a means of trying to just really ensure that there's broad alignment at the company and making sure that you know, management's pushing and rowing in the same direction as the board and and as the investors want to be moving as well. I suppose next, even companies that do, you know, sort of everything right or, or use their best efforts to really make sure that they're focused on ESG and taking all the steps that we've been discussing, some are going to be approached nonetheless by an activist uh, with an ESG themed inquiry or demand. What do they do? Lauren, the key is to be prepared to have a, what we call the break glass action plan in in place. The activists move extraordinarily rapidly. They are experts at using the financial media, reporters at Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, on Kramer, on TV. And, And so you need to have your advisor team, your board prepared in advance so that you can move extraordinarily rapidly if an activist comes at a company. We always encourage companies to engage with the activists early in this process. You can use those meetings to gather information on the activist concerns and their plans so that you can better respond to their attack. In these meetings, you should emphasize always that the board and management are always interested in the views and opinions of shareholders and are committed to enhancing shareholder value. You don't need to say much more than that, and you certainly should not get in a tit-for-tat with the activists on their proposals. The goal of these meetings isn't to convince the activists to change its mind. You have a very low likelihood of success on that front. The goal of the meeting is to to demonstrate to the rest of the shareholder base that you're meeting with the activists, you're considering their ideas thoughtfully, and you're responding to those ideas. So your audience in this meeting is much less the activists you're meeting with and more so your ability to tell the story to the other shareholders 
that you're taking the situation seriously. In these meetings, there's always a few key things to keep in mind. I always say it, it's regulation FD+. plus. Anything you say in these meetings can be used against you. And so you need to limit your discussion to publicly available information and recognize that any quote can be taken out of context and be put in a press release the next day. And you should also recognize that not only management needs to be prepared for these meetings, but also select directors. It's rare that we put activists in front of the full board, but it is more and more common that they're having meetings with one or two members of the board as part of this engagement process. And are you doing the prep, given the speed at which the activists move, is that prep in terms of getting your management and your board members ready and prepared for how to respond and engage in those meetings? Is that something that companies should be doing before they're even approached? You know, the way I guess in elementary school we did fire drills, or is this something that more often it's okay to wait and you just need to make sure that you sort of get the right advice and the right consultants to help everybody get up to speed and on the same page once you've been approached by the activist? So with respect to the specific items to do's and don'ts for the meetings, those can wait until the activist emerges, but there are steps that, planning steps that should be taken right away. We, we do highly recommend that clients be their own activists and prepare a mock attack deck, working with their financial advisors to do so, which will identify a range of arguments that the activist might make and prepare responses against those arguments. And the other key is to have that defense team, which is usually a subset of the board, senior management, a financial advisor, a legal advisor, and a PR advisor identified in advance, working group lists with cell phones so that the group can meet in a matter of hours if a significant threat emerges. Got it. So it sounds like it really it's it's about being nimble um, fundamentally. That's that's a very good way to summarize it, Lauren. Well, this has been a great overview on takeover defense and shareholder activism with uh, a lot of really helpful insight. Thanks again to Chris and Tiffany for being our guests today. Yes, thanks for having us, Lauren. It was great to be involved. Thanks, Lauren. And finally, thank you to our listeners for checking out this episode of the Energy and Infrastructure podcast in our Connected with Latham series. Stay tuned for more episodes coming soon, where we'll cover other key topics in the evolving energy and infrastructure sector. You can subscribe and listen to new and archived episodes of Latham's podcasts on LW.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. If you'd like more information about the topics in this podcast, please email us using the links located in the show description. We hope you'll join us again next time. This podcast is provided as a service of Latham & Watkins, LLP. Listening to this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and Latham and & Watkins, LLP, and you should not send confidential information to Latham & Watkins, LLP. While we make every effort to assure that the content of this podcast is accurate, comprehensive, and current, we do not warrant or guarantee any of those things. And you may not rely on this podcast as a substitute for legal research and or consulting a qualified attorney. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for engaging a lawyer to advise you on your individual needs. Should you require legal advice on the issues covered in this podcast, please consult a qualified attorney. Under New York's Code of Professional Responsibility, portions of this communication contain attorney advertising. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Results depend upon a variety of factors unique to each representation. Please direct all inquiries regarding the conduct of Latham & Watkins attorneys under the New York's disciplinary rules to Latham & Watkins, LLP, 885 3rd Avenue, New York, New York, 10022-4834, phone number 1212-906-1200.